Okay, we're continuing today with our types of clauses. I hope you have a pretty good handle on adjective and adverb clauses. Today we're going to move on to noun clauses. Noun clauses function as subjects, predicate nouns, objects, or positives. They are introduced by subordinating conjunctions, indefinite relative pronouns, and indefinite relative adverbs. They often begin with the subordinating conjunction that. So let's look at a few examples. My philosophy is that time is a valuable resource. So here we have that as our subordinating word. The clause is that time is a valuable resource. So look at our sentence pattern. Philosophy is, philosophy is what? That time is a valuable resource. So the whole clause is functioning as a predicate noun, noun function. I believe that the Lord will give us strength according to our days. So again, we have subordinating that, that the Lord will give us strength according to our days. Look at your sentence pattern. I believe, I believe what? The whole clause is the direct object, that the Lord will give us strength according to our days. So you can see how the noun clause functions as a noun within the sentence. A couple more examples. This morning's announcement that the standoff was over. So that's the clause. It comes after announcement. This is actually going to be an appositive. Don't forget a positive as a noun function. So the announcement that the standoff was over. That's the function of that noun clause. Here we have a clause beginning the sentence that slothful men will have their just reward. That's our subordinating that right there. This whole thing is the subject of that sentence. And one more noun function. The outcome is a question of whether the board will accept our proposal. So here we have whether the board will accept our proposal. We have whether this is going to be, this is a preposition, so our noun function here is going to be the object of the preposition. Now, noun clauses can also be introduced by other words, like indefinite relative pronouns and indefinite relative adverbs. So let's look at what some of those are. Indefinite relative pronouns do not have an antecedent in the independent clause. They substitute for something indefinite or unknown in the noun clause itself. And these are the indefinite relative pronouns that you'll be looking for. This, this is not a complete list. There's our complete list. We have our evers in there too. And those are more easily recognized as indefinite, but all of these are indefinite relative pronouns that could introduce noun clauses. Let's look at a few examples of these. Finish the book and discover what happens. What happens is our clause. This, the word what, the indefinite relative pronoun what, is actually functioning as the subject within that clause. What happens. Okay, but the whole clause is functioning as a direct object. The subject of the sentence is the understood you. You finish and discover, compound verb. You finish and discover what? What happens? That's how it's a direct object. So a lot of things going on in that little short sentence. God will give wisdom to whoever asks him for it. So we have whoever, our indefinite relative pronoun. The whole clause, whoever asks him for it. And notice here, this is a preposition. So the whole clause is the object of a preposition. And then one more here, whose it was, there's the pronoun, and the whole thing is the subject. Whose it was was obvious. So when they're introduced by the indefinite relative pronouns, they're still functioning as noun clauses. Now let's look at ones with indefinite relative adverbs. These are going to substitute for something unknown in the noun clause. They modify the verb of the noun clause, not of the whole sentence. And then they are when, where, why, and how. So let's look at a few example sentences. None of the students knew why the meeting was called. So here's our clause. Here's our indefinite relative adverb. And what is the function of the noun clause in the sentence? Students, oh, excuse me, none is the subject. None knew, knew what? Why the meeting was called? That is a direct object. 
this one, how he won the contest. So there's our indefinite relative adverb. The whole thing is the subject. How he won the contest was a surprise to everyone. Okay, so noun clauses can be a little bit more difficult because they have more types of words that can introduce them, and they also have several functions within the sentence, which can be kind of fun to look for, but there are more of them. So noun clauses can be more difficult, but if you just remember that they're always gonna function as a noun and fit them into your sentence patterns, they're not that hard. So let's look at a few example sentences. The idea that perfect justice originates with God is demonstrated in the Bible. So we have the subordinating word that. The idea that perfect justice originates with God. Now what's the subject of the sentence? Idea, what's the verb, is demonstrated. Okay, so again, working with your sentence patterns is going to help you determine the function of this clause. This is functioning as a positive. It's coming after the noun idea and just restating it, that perfect justice originates with God. So that is a noun function of and a positive. All right. How Abraham interceded with God before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is our clause. Okay, we've got our subordinating word right here. Look at your sentence pattern. We read. Okay, this is when where we would have a implied we read of, and so this would be an object of preposition. That's a little bit harder because you have to get that implied word in there, but I hope you can see how it still functions as a noun in the sentence. Okay, let's look at sentence number three. Let's actually start with our sentence pattern on this one. We'll say, what's the subject of this sentence? Acts, what is the verb? Were, and that's gonna be a linking verb might want to point out here that this is a participial phrase committed in these wicked cities. An adjective, participial phrase, of course, has an adjective modifying acts. That's not what you were having, to, what you needed to do here, but I just wanted to point that out. And then acts were what? Well, we got a subordinating word here. We have a clause. What ignited God's righteous indignation? So this is going to be, because it's a linking verb, it's going to be a predicate noun. So the whole clause serves that noun function of the predicate noun. All right, sentence number four. Plan is the subject. Would give is the verb. It would give, oh, this should be kind of a clue there. Whoever, that should jump out yet, yet you as an indefinite relative pronoun, whoever was in its path. Total annihilation. Okay, so plan would give what? Total annihilation, that would be your direct object, so it would give to whom? Whoever was in its path. So this noun clause is an indirect object. All right, even though God is always just in whatever he determines to do, again, lots of things going on in this sentence. I'm going to start with the subject and verb. The subject doesn't come until down here with Abraham. Abraham appealed Okay, so we have our basic main subject and verb. We want to look at what else is going on in the sentence. Even though God is always just in whatever he determines to do, that is actually opening with an adverb clause. Whatever is our subordinating word for our noun clause. So again, this is, this is an, the whole thing is an adverb clause. There's the subject of the clause. There's the verb of the clause. There's a predicate adjective of the clause, not of the whole sentence. And then we have, what do we have here? We have a preposition. So this is going to be, this noun clause is going to be the object of the preposition. So again, a whole lot of things going on in that sentence. But I hope that you can see as we isolate different parts of the sentence how that noun clause still has its own separate noun function, even though there are lots of other things going on with this. Now, I want you to work out a few sentences on your own. Do your best with these and we'll look at them next time. Edgar Allan Poe. Most people either love him or hate him. Poe is one of the most famous American authors of all time. 
If you ask the average person what type of writer Poe was, you might get answers like he wrote horror stories or he wrote weird poems about death. And neither of those are necessarily wrong, but Poe is a lot more multifaceted than either of those descriptions would imply. Poe was one of the most widely read 19th century authors. He was orphaned as a child and then informally adopted by the Allens. Poe's parents were both stage actors. His father deserted them, then his mother died of tuberculosis. Poe was only a toddler. The Allen family in Virginia had some loose connections to his parents, so they adopted him, but not officially. They saw that he was well-educated, but he had trouble sticking to any one thing. He left the University of Virginia after one term because he'd accumulated gambling debts. So he served in the Army for two years. Poe ended up with an appointment to West Point Military Academy, but he couldn't handle submitting to authority, so he was dismissed. But by that time, he had already published some poetry. He published his first volume of poetry anonymously at age 18, and then began writing short stories in 1833. Now, we learned at the beginning of this unit that the short story was one of the genres that was really developed in America during this Romantic period. Poe was the first one to really accomplish this. He elevated the genre of short story to an art form. He also created the detective story. He became known as the father of detective fiction. So no, Sherlock Holmes was not the first literary detective. Auguste Dupin was, and he was created by Edgar Allan Poe. Poe became an editor to make ends meet. He held positions as editor at many publications, primarily because he usually ended up losing his job because he would fight with the owners of the publications. Poe was probably not an easy person to work with. He married his 13-year-old cousin, Virginia Clem, in 1835. Although it was a strange marriage, even back then, Poe's home life was now more stable than it had ever been in his whole life. He produced a lot more writing during this time, although he was still poor and he had a drinking problem. Twelve years after their marriage, Virginia died, also of tuberculosis, as his mother had. And then Poe himself died mysteriously in 1849. It's kind of fitting that a writer of mysteries and horror would leave behind a mystery in the form of his own death. Poe had become recently engaged to a woman named Elmira Shelton. He'd left his home in Richmond to see her and conduct some editing business. On his way to Philadelphia, he stopped in Baltimore, and that's where he was found comatose in a gutter. The man who found him recognized him as the famous writer Edgar Allan Poe, but Poe never regained enough consciousness to tell anyone what had happened to him, and he died four days later. There are several theories about his death, and we could write whole books about those, so we won't go into all of them. The physician who attended his death listed the cause of death as phrenitis, which is swelling of the brain. Well, that could have been caused by a lot of different things. Some of the more popular theories have been meningitis or rabies, but there's also good reason to suspect that Poe could have been beaten or even been a victim of an elaborate voter fraud scheme. Reading the, th the theories about Poe's death is fascinating, but we won't take any more time with it here. We will say that Poe insisted on high literary standards. In his literary criticism, Poe was pretty harsh, but he was brilliant, and his insistence that literature should be highly aesthetic was instrumental in developing a national literature comparable to England's. Poe believed that the human mind is divided into three faculties, the intellect, the soul, and the conscience. He said that truth appeals to the intellect, beauty appeals to the soul, and duty appeals to the conscience. So Poe hated the didactic nature of much of American literature up to this point. Think about it. We know the earliest literature in America was almost completely didactic, but even the last group of writers we just studied had a lot of instruction in their writing, so much social commentary, even though most of it was done in an artful way. And of course, the transcendentalists are didactic. They're really good at telling everyone what to think, all while telling them that their own thoughts are what's most important. But Poe says no. He speaks of the heresy of the didactic. Poe thought that didacticism in literature was inartistic. The problem with Poe is that he didn't believe truth could appeal to the soul, only beauty, so only the aesthetic. But of course, beauty and truth are not mutually exclusive. Truth can be expressed artistically and beautifully. Poe was also concerned with proper length, and you'll probably appreciate this. He believed that both poetry and fiction should be short enough to be read in one sitting. Suppose aesthetic principles were brevity, short enough to be read in one sitting, and also unity of effect. He believed that all work should be dominated by a single emotion or mood. 
Remember that Poe is the first of our transcendental pessimist authors. He's still a romantic author, but he opposed transcendentalism on aesthetic grounds. He's very pessimistic about mankind. None of that green apple man is getting better every day stuff for him. The world and nature in Poe's writings is not benevolent creation revealing truth to men. It's more like a nightmare of evil and death. So let's look at our before reading goals. We're going to analyze mood, irony, and sound devices. We already know that Poe believed any one piece of literature should display only one emotion or mood. So mood is the main feature of Poe's work. We would define mood as the emotional atmosphere of a work, the feeling that the reader is meant to share with the characters. Poe's mood was generally melancholy, and that mood in his works was usually produced by reflections on the death of a beautiful woman. That's Poe's major theme in his poetry. In his fiction, his short stories, the mood was usually horror or terror. So as you read Poe, think about how the word choice and the details of the story work together to create the mood. Now we also have irony, which is essentially a contrast between appearance and reality. So verbal irony is irony occurring when a speaker's meaning differs from what is expressed in words. And then dramatic irony is a type of irony in which the reader is aware of a plot development of which a character in the story is unaware. The short story, The Cask of Amontillado, contains a great deal of irony, both verbal and dramatic. So as you read that short story, think about how he creates and uses both kinds of irony. Now we'll also be looking at sound devices that Poe uses, especially in his poetry. Both The Raven and Annabelle Lee are usually considered to have musical qualities. Poe uses a variety of meters as well as repetition, including alliteration and assonance. So alliteration, you know this, but it's the repetition of initial consonant sounds in nearby words or stressed syllables. And then assonance is the repetition of similar or identical vowel sounds in nearby words, usually in stressed syllables. Open here I flung the shutter when with many a flirt and flutter. So we have both alliteration and assonance in that. You're going to read two poems for your first Poe reading assignment. So look for these sound devices and pay attention to the meter as, as you read to see how he achieves this musical effect. And then for our read goal, we're going to detect persona. Since we're paying a lot of attention to the authors in this course and learning what their beliefs are and therefore what messages they wanted to leave, we tend to think of almost every work as autobiographical. With much of the literature we've studied so far, that makes sense. As we've just said, most of it has been didactic, so the author was wanting to make an intrusion and deliver a personal message. Now that we're getting even more into fiction, specifically short stories, we need to remember that fiction writers often adopt a persona for a story. So a persona is a character who narrates the story or the poem. So even if a story is narrated in first person, we can't assume that it's really the voice of the author. The persona might be like the author, but not necessarily. So even a personal pronoun being used in one of Poe's stories doesn't mean that Poe is the one talking. In short, a persona is a character. And when you read the short story, The Cask of Amontillado, you'll be reading the story through the persona of a first person narrator. And then we're going to evaluate the pessimistic view of man's nature. We've already said that Poe's take on humanity was quite different from his transcendentalist contemporaries. They said that mankind is gradually progressing toward perfection. Poe created characters who were usually caught in a downward spiral of psychological and moral disintegration. So you'll have some vocabulary to look at as well. Obeisance, beguile, craven, placid, respite, retribution, virtuoso, accost, motley, rampant, and aperture. Quite a few words, so make sure you pay attention to those definitions. Now for your assignment today, you'll read the two poems by Poe, The Raven and Annabelle Lee. We'll discuss them next time, and then you'll move on to the short story, The Cask of Amontillado.